Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today, we're going to talk about working the law. This is coming from a book called Working with the Law by Raymond Hollowell. Raymond Hollowell was a student and master of the laws of living. He was informed by years of study and research in all the great religions and philosophies, as well as modern psychology and the new science. He authored many books, the cornerstone of which is his classic offering, Working with the Law. While his writing was done at a time before he had politically correct gender balancing in the words chosen, Raymond Hollowell was deeply honoring women as well as men. When he used the word man in his writing, he was speaking to every one of us. In the foreword written in the book, Working with the Law, Mary Morrissey writes that during the two years I studied, lived, and breathed the teachings of this man, I knew I was in the rarefied air of greatness. He not only spoke the words, he lived and demonstrated the mastery that comes only with an incorporation of the liberating truths of life that he had discovered and taught. The book is amazing, and it breaks down different laws, which is why we'll return to it. And he talks about the law of thinking, law of supply, the law of attraction, the law of receiving, the law of increase, the law of compensation, the law of non-resistance, the law of forgiveness, the law of sacrifice, obedience, and success. And I want to cover each of these laws, as we have already done, but this will add to our general understanding of these laws. It is very important to continually remind yourself of the working laws as we understand them in reality creation, and these can be taken from these classic New Thought teachers that wrote from a very insightful and empowering time where they were talking about these subjects in a different way than we do today. And a lot of times this information seems to be more pure when I'm reading it as opposed to different authors in the present day. Today I want to read the general intro to get an idea of his philosophy, and that is working the law. And when we say the law, really, he is talking about God, and you can replace the word law with God when he talks about it as he explains. But it's how to use this divine intelligence, this primal substance, this first cause, and how we can use it to formulate and interact with in a way that we can take advantage of these laws, master them, and we can be of great service to others in the process. An understanding of these things brings balance, harmony, and greater amounts of love and joy into your life. The more I understand these laws and apply them on a rational, conscious, and consistent basis, the more my life flourishes like a flower and blossoms in so many wonderful ways. And I challenge you to be constantly aware of these laws. When you become aware of the law of compensation or the law of obedience and you apply these principles, they may seem so simple and cliche, yet it is true. When I tell you that we are living in a simulation, the proof is that our lives consistently work within these given laws. These laws come from archetypes and states and help us to understand the Creator in different ways. He begins in the preface by saying, Students for many years have come to the school asking for a better understanding of God and desiring knowledge of the best way to get the most out of life. They have heard God spoken of as being afar off, when He is as close to us as the breath we breathe, closer than our hands and feet. They have heard Him spoken of as love, divine mind, divine intelligence, Jehovah, God, Lord, first cause, primal substance, and other names. Being of an analytical mind, I, too, have wanted to know the facts of a truth. If it is a truth, there are facts to be had, and they can prove themselves not alone in spirit, but in a very practical way. It is my intention to present these lessons simply without high-minded words or vague statements that sound pretty and promising. The terms above named are all synonymous. They mean one and the same thing and I choose to use a simpler name that everyone will understand. I shall call God working in our lives law. 
interpreting the law in several ways should bring it more clearly into our way of thinking. Then, as we strive to work with the law, we are living closer to God, and such living brings a better understanding. As you grow in knowledge and are able to form better opinions, do not hesitate to change your views. Remember, the wise man changes his mind, the fool never. There can be no progress without change, no growth without renewal. There must be a constant stream of new thought, better thought, and truer thought to ensure progression in life. As soon as you perceive the better, let go of the old, grasp the new. To continue to hold on to the old and inferior when the new and superior is at hand is to retard growth. And to this one cause may be traced many of the ills of man. Proceed to use your thinking faculty and take care that it does not use you. Master your mind and guide it intelligently. That is, exercise discrimination in all your thinking. Learn to think as you ought to think. Give your mental life to the matters that are absolutely essential to your welfare and the balance of your thought to themes of beauty, truth, and progress. In other words, live with the ideal, but do not neglect the practical. Aim to adjust the two and strive to be on the outside what you idealize on the inside. Your thoughts make you, and your ideals, principles, or ruling desires will determine your destiny. Learn to use your powers unless you wish to be used by them. Make a daily effort to use the knowledge you have gained. Try to improve upon all your opinions. Endeavor to obtain a truer and larger conception of each of your personal views. This process entails effort, but all such mental discipline is highly constructive. It leads to a steady increase of mind power, and it is the mind that matters most among life's actualities. You may occasionally blunder. We are all inclined to do this more so in the earlier stages of our mental development. However, we learn by our mistakes. Then, by the constant use of our intelligence, we cause our faculties to grow so strong and alert that in time we are able to avoid further errors. Man's problems are mental in nature. They have no existence outside of themselves, and it has been discovered that nearly all will yield up their solutions when subjected to a broad and exact analysis. You can acquire this ability by studying the law of life and its modes of expression. Then, by constant effort, use your thinking faculty in constructive ways. As you work with these laws, have good and sound reasons for all the views you hold. As you try to find these, many of your old-time views will fall to pieces. Form clear and definite ideas regarding your convictions as to why you do as you do and as to why you think as you think. Such practice is like conducting a mental house cleaning. The practice of clear thinking tends to clarify the mind, tones up the faculties, sharpens the perceptions, and gives one a stronger and better grasp of the basic essentials for larger, richer life. Clear and exact thinking is a very great necessity. It is, in fact, a sure means to advancement on the material as well as the spiritual planes. A line of distinction, however, should be drawn between mere surface thought that is ordinary, trivial, and commonplace thinking and real thought, which is associated with the understanding of truth. The latter is deep thinking which arouses dormant powers, quickens the perceptions, and leads to the enlargement of the understanding. The former is but a passing phase of mental activity, while the latter governs the life of man. The shallow surface thought that we give to the ordinary duties and small things of daily life is not the thought that reforms our character, develops our mind, or changes our destiny. It is the positive, deep, and penetrating thought that comes from profound and strong conviction born of a higher perception and a clearer realization of the truth. The surface idea is not the real thought. The inner convictions 
which control one's aims, desires, and motives, constitute the real thought of the individual and wholly determine the course of his life and personal destiny. Psychologists tell us that every individual is controlled by his convictions, whether he is aware of it or not. Such convictions largely determine the nature of his thinking. The inner thought coming from the heart represents the real motives and desires. These are the causes of actions. If his ideas or convictions are wholesome and true to his higher nature, all will be well, and he will reflect something of the harmony and beauty and utility of his constructive and superior views in his personal life. If his convictions or ideas are not wholesome and true, he will reflect something that is discordant, inharmonious, and evil. Always make it a point of moving forward in your mind, ever seeking to unfold your power of thought and to develop hidden possibilities. Learn to train the mind to clear and exact thinking. Your ability to do so will grow rapidly by regular exercise and discipline. No normal person wants to decrease in power and ability. Therefore, strive to cultivate your intelligence and to express better, bigger, and superior thought on all matters about which you may think. There is so much good in the world that it can outbalance the evil. Therefore, you can go on thinking more constructive and good thoughts every day about yourself, your fellow man, life, and all natural things to the constant enrichment of your mind and the improvement of your whole being. You cannot get the most out of these lessons by reading them once or twice. They should be read often and studied with scrutiny. You will find with each reading something clearer than before. The Author Working the Law the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. Genesis 2, 4, 5 The question uppermost in the world of thought today is whether a man has the capacity, equipment, and power to control his life. Whether he can be what he wants to be or whether he is a drop in the great ocean of life. Millions are affected by unemployment, poverty, and want. Can they help it? Where we have thousands of homes broken on the rocks of matrimony, can such a breach be repaired? Millions complain of sickness and disorder in countless forms. All this gives rise to the belief that we are victims of circumstance over which we have no control. Such belief makes us fatalists and karmic addicts instead of masters and controllers of our destinies. A fatalistic belief is contagious and when man submits to its influence, believing that the circumstances around him are stronger than the power within him, that man is defeated before the race is run. In the history of the race, in the biography of man, there is a long list of evidences of man overcoming circumstances and meeting his problems of life. Evolution and anthropology alike furnish the truth that man is responsible for what he is. He has power to control his circumstances, and by using this power, he has created other circumstances more necessary in his upward climb. Yet some, not sure that we create our circumstances, are rather prone to think that they are caused by heredity, karma, environment, or numerous other external things. These are the real reasons, they think, for our failures. They believe in the natural limitations of life. They live in the conviction that as we are, so we must remain. They are sure that what is to be will be. The scientist, on the other hand, searching into the mysteries of human life reveals to us a wonderful world of power, possibility, and promise. He tells us that the mind is the creative cause of all that transpires in the life of man, that the personal conditions are the results of man's action, that all the actions of man are the direct outcome of his ideas, 
that we never make a move of any kind until we first form image or plan in the mind. These plans or ideas are powerfully potent. They are the causes, good, bad, or indifferent, of the following effects which in turn correspond to their natures. He tells us that these ideas liberate a tremendous energy. Hence, when we learn to employ our minds constructively, we use correctively these hidden powers, forces, and faculties. This, the scientist tells us, is the key to success in living life. There is a marvelous inner world that exists within man, and the revelation of such a world enables man to do, to attain, and to achieve anything he desires within the bounds or limits of nature. I believe the reason the famous English literary genius William Shakespeare is the leading dramatist of the world lies in this realm. The great Greek dramatists, with their noted insight, always saw the causes in some external fate or destiny that brought about the downfall of their characters. But Shakespeare saw something within the man as the cause of his failure or success. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. We see Hamlet wrestling with his reluctant, indecisive soul. Macbeth is being pulled and driven by his ambition. Othello is torn and discomfited by his jealousy. Always the characters were battling with their inner selves as though the dramatists were saying, you are the master of your circumstances. Call forth your power, initiative, and ingenuity and be the master. Fate is in your hands. Determine it. If every man has the power and privilege to determine his fortune, what is that power? How can we recognize it? If all conditions are the result of our actions and all actions are the outcome or the fruit of our ideas, then our ideas must determine the conditions in our daily lives. An idea is a thought or a group of thoughts. An idea is an image or picture in the mind. There must have been an idea, a mental picture, back of every well-known achievement and invention. From the beginning, this is the creative plan. We read in the first book of the Bible that the great architect God saw a finished pattern or idea before it grew. There was a mental picture established within the mind of the Creator before it became a reality on the without in some form of a creature. The Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. Every architect and builder follows the same plan, whether he is building or planning a house, a bridge, an institution, or his own life. Every man is his own designer and builder. Like the Creator, he makes his creations within before they materialize on the outside. All fears of sickness, poverty, and old age are impressions, ideas, and mental pictures long before they become painful realities. Every idea and mental picture must produce after its own kind, whether the picture is good or bad. The law determines it so. The law does not question or challenge the kind of picture we give to it. It only knows that it must take what is offered or planted and then processed to materialize it into visible form. Some men can visualize great engineering achievements, yet they do not know that by the same method they can overcome their diseases and despairs and enjoy the health and happiness they long for. Mechanical engineering is the same as mental engineering. They are both dependent wholly upon a creative intelligence. Mental photography, like mechanical photography, produces exactly what it sees. A picture of a homely, unsightly person never turns out to look like a beauty pageant winner nor does a little short person look tall and large on a photograph. A picture of black will not be white. Neither can negative, destroying ideas produce constructive and positive results. If the ideas are negative, they will in turn create negative results. I knew a woman who once lived in a beautiful home in an exclusive suburban district with every comfort that wealth could supply to make her happy. This home was a large, rambling house facing a beautiful lake with green terraces sloping to its edge. Flower gardens, perfectly kept, were scattered freely along each path throughout the estate. She had many servants to help her, and from observation, her life was just about as complete as one might dream about. But with all this wealth and beauty, the woman was heard to remark to her friends that she hoped the day would come 
when she would be relieved of the big house and all its problems and could live in a trunk. She wanted a room to herself for herself and just large enough to move about without any extra space to dust and to keep clean. A few years elapsed, her husband died and left the estate to her. She sold the home at a sacrifice. Her other holdings depreciated so much in value through unwise investments and transfers that she had but a small income left. She went to live with her sister, and true to her wish, she now has a small room on the third floor and practically lives in a trunk. Whether she is happier now before, I do not know, but I doubt it. One thing I do know, that is she gradually led herself to the small room and privations when her consciousness began to grow small and limited. She unconsciously touched the creative principle and supplied it with ideas of smallness and privacy and limitations which materialized within a few years' time. As we assimilate in mind these ideas or mental pictures, we knowingly or unknowingly exercise a power to produce them. This creative process continues working night and day until the idea is completed. We cannot picture thoughts of poverty, failure, disease, and doubt, and expect in return to enjoy wealth, success, health, and courage. It just can't be done any more than the photographer can take a beautiful picture of a homely creature. This creative principle is summarized in a sentence found in Proverbs. It reads, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You may have read or heard the statement before. It has been taught and expounded by philosophers of every age. You may have tried to prove the statement by reading from your memory all negative thoughts, but because it took determined and persistent effort, you wearied. Then you dropped back into the current of old conditions and ideas, and if anything became worse off than before, others hearing the statement were not impressed, for they could not accept the assertion that all in harmonies of life are the result of their own beliefs or of their past thinking crystallized into beliefs. They prefer to blame this upon something or someone else. Even God has given a share of the blame. There are others who believe that in God's good, time all things will eventually work out to their satisfaction, but this is not so. These people are planning for a heaven to be gained at some future time when it is actually a condition and state of mind that can be had now, as well as hereafter. In fact, unless it is gained here and now, it can never be had in the future. At some time in a man's life, he is forced to reckon with this creative law. There is no alternative. Everyone is governed by the law, whether he knows it or not. Possibly it is the same idea that some have concerning prayer. They think it is God's fault, will, or desire when they do not get the answer they seek. They use God as their scapegoat and excuse when their prayers are unanswered or when they are unable to explain some act of God or of nature. God's will be done is one of the most overworked and least understood statements in our day. Some use the idea as a crutch to lean upon when in reality it is a powerful bridge over which man may cross the deepest chasms and mysteries. It is man's failure if his prayers are unanswered. The creative law is ever ready to answer and cannot fail to respond when approached rightly and wisely. At the moment that man is able to contact and to realize the law, he will at once enjoy the benefits. It is the realization of the law in action that determines manifestation. An electrician, for example, does not pray and wait for the electric energy to make up its mind to serve him. He learns firsthand the laws of conduction and transmission in order to know how to cooperate with the law that governs electric energy. After gaining this knowledge, he can go ahead and set up the machinery which provides the means to generate and direct the power. Then he can snap in a switch and operate giant machines, create heat, set in motion countless other devices or flood a room with light. He can do this not once or twice, but as many times as he chooses, so long as he does not disturb the mechanics or violate the law governing the energy. The same principle holds true in all other sciences, including the science of mind. There is a scientific way of thinking about everything, a true and right way that prevents the needless waste of mental energy and produces the desired results on all occasions. As explained, all things and events, all experiences and conditions of life are results 
All results, however, will vary in quality and quantity in accordance with the degree of knowledge possessed and in the measure of the mind's activity. The quality of the results produced by the individual thinker may be good, bad, or indifferent, as may be determined by conscious direction and choice or lack of such, some results being harmonious and favorable while others are discordant and unfavorable. Or they may be a medley of the whole. It is absolutely essential to give intelligent direction to the creative powers of the mind to obtain the best and largest results in our particular sphere of active expression. In fact, it is highly important, from the standpoint of usefulness and common duty, that we should endeavor to understand the mind and its workings, and learn how to cultivate and develop those processes of thinking that will give us mastery over life and its conditions. Thinking is a perpetual process. It is a creative function of life that is ever going on. We are engaged in it and are producing results of some kind every hour and day that we live, registering within ourselves the exact effects of all our thinking. While we cannot stop thinking, yet we possess the supreme privilege of being able to determine the sort of results it is desired to experience by regulating the form and quality of our thought. How this is done is a simple and effective manner is explained throughout these lessons. Our main object is to arouse the individual to think for himself, to cultivate his own powers, and thereby to take the sure paths of self-development and true culture. The great self-evident fact, which cannot be too often repeated, is that when we think our thinking for the better, we automatically change our lives for the better. Modern psychology has conclusively demonstrated that a change of thought must precede every change in the life and in the affairs of man. In the course of our studies, we have discovered that the more a mind is undeveloped, the more materialistic or lower its individual point of view. While the more developed the mind, the higher its individual point of view. It does not follow that because a person is worldly wise and has retained a large number of facts and experiences, such a one has a well-developed or highly evolved mind. On the contrary, that person may have an undeveloped mind and be largely dominated by the lower instincts, narrowness of thought, limited views, prejudiced convictions, and materialistic opinions are signs of a lack of real development, breadth of thought, wide intolerant views, wholesome convictions, and expanding conceptions are signs of growth. The small mind, however, need not remain small or undeveloped. It can grow and expand and ultimately become great. The path is clear and simple. Let such a one form his own clear conceptions and strong convictions from the loftiest point of view he can reach and then proceed to think and act accordingly. Advancement will follow as a natural sequence. The law is that the mind is no greater than its conceptions. As you improve and enlarge your ideas and mental pictures, you improve and enlarge your mind. As you aspire to realize the larger truth, you must inevitably grow in understanding. Again, the greater your power of mind, the better you will be able to conduct the affairs of life to use and advantage. Next we may ask if there is such a law of mind, what is the law's intention? Some may think that the universal mind has no intention because it is impersonal, yet Jesus tells us that the universal mind has definite intentions. He says, fear not little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Thus we see that the universal mind's intention is for the universal good, therefore our intention must take the same direction, knowing that whatever works for the universal good will work for the individual good, for the individual's health and happiness on the same principle, the principle that which blesses the whole will bless all its parts. When our intention becomes reconciled or cooperative with the universal intention, then we become an expression of that good. This is working with the law. When man's intention is as God's intention, and not just a mere personal caprice, a force is called into action which gives direction to the undirected mind power. Working with the law when we understand it may become as simple as touching the light button like the electrician, which when we do floods our mentality with illumination and understanding. 
We hear much today about cooperation, united effort, merging of forces and pulling together as a single unit or team. We know the advantage of teamwork in our games of sport and play. We learn from our games that no grandstand play or individual show-off is dependable. It is likewise true with the game of living life. No man can play the game alone. He must conform with the law, and it is better to cooperate with it than to be used blindly by it. Someone said, man with himself as a partner is a fool, but with God, law is a majority. Thus, when man is able to combine or direct all his thoughts, ideas, and desires for good, he will be able to bring forth a continued stream of good. Again, referring to the Master and appreciating all the good work and miracles he accomplished, we see that he never took personal credit for the result. He knew the law, and by working with it, was able to perform miracles to the amazement of the unenlightened public. He said, It is not me, but the Father, law in me, that doeth the work. Thus all things work together for them that love good, who live the law, because the love of good unites itself with a stream of good, and not because good steps out of its way to show its gratitude. All failures in life are due to taking sides with the finite around us. All success in life is due to taking sides with the law within us. Thus, working with the law may be considered the same as taking the law into our minds and lives as a silent partner. We are then conscious of the source and creator of all power and realize and receive the many benefits that surround us. You, who are searching and grasping any and every idea that comes along in the hope that it will be a shortcut method to solve the problems of life, you, who condemn and blame every misunderstood person or thing for your failures and defeats, will never find a satisfying life that way. You will find only an existence and at its best will be variable and changing. Life, with all its attributes of good, is a something that doesn't just happen to touch a fortunate few. It is a something you must create. It is a something you must plan, mentally picture, and think about. You, who are seeking love, fortune, happiness, and success, must understand that it is not something you may find, you cannot buy it nor borrow it from another. No one can give it to you. You must create it within yourself. Your desires and ideas are like seeds you plant in the soil, but these are planted in the soil of mind. After planting the thought seeds, you cultivate them, nurture them, and guard them well until the harvest time. Then you will reap all that you have sown and abundantly. Of course, he who has the cleanest and most fertile gardens will enjoy the best returns. We may realize from this lesson that we have the capacity for we can think and in our thinking create desires and ideas. We have the equipment. It comprises the ideas and thought seeds that we plant in the soil of the mind. We have the power. For the universal power of mind is endowed within each and every one of us. All that we may ever desire to have and to be is ours for the asking as we correctly apply the law of life, the law of mind. When a circumstance arises, we are not to come under it, to submit to it in servitude, but we are to surmount it, to overcome and master it by exercising the creative law of thinking and thus grow in wisdom and power. For as Dr. John Murray so often said, we are according to our system of ideas. And in this wonderful introduction, Raymond Hollowell really establishes the importance of understanding these laws. And I most definitely, over several episodes, plan to explore these laws, which we have already explored in depth, including the law of attraction, the law of receiving, the law of supply, the law of thinking, the law of non-resistance and the law of forgiveness, the law of sacrifice, obedience, 
and success. Each of these laws are critical in understanding the function of the simulation. These laws are programs and codes that if we understand, we can tap into them and they will allow us to experience bold new heights in ecstasy, love, joy, and prosperity, which you all deserve. The law is within you. And you can ignore it all you want, but you are interacting with it, just as he explains in the story of the woman that has the perfect life, the perfect house, and she is begging to be in a small room and she gets it. Are you thinking small or are you thinking big? For whatever you're thinking in relation to that infinite substance shall come to pass in your thinking, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And it all comes down to an understanding of working the law. If you take time with me, follow my episodes, slowly over time we will expand our understandings of these laws as we do with all things. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. I'd love it if you checked out my art. You can find it at www.newearth.art. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.